So I'm going to be talking about High Point, which is a large-scale residential development, circa 450 units. Um, and obviously, in, uh, in this day and age in our industry, one can't really finish a sentence talking about a residential project of such scale without talking about prefabrication, off-site manufacture, volumetric, modular, and all of these buzzwords that we all hear about all the time. And this is a slide that we often put in front of our clients to talk about all the different options that we have across a range of key structural materials um, in terms of how we might prefabricate um, or use off-site manufacturing techniques. What I don't think is talked about enough is the role of the design team. Um, and I think this is especially a problem within um, residential um, projects and with housing developers. I think it's very important that there is the right design team members around the table early on in a project that understand the full spectrum of prefabrication techniques and can thus choose the most appropriate system for a given site and a given building. Um, which is exactly what we tried to do on our project High Point. Bearing in mind this started back in 2003, okay, where we perhaps talked about prefabrication a little less than we do these days. Um, this is an elephant and castle. The original developer was first base um, with architects uh, Roger Sterk Harbour and Partners. Um, it started pre-recession, it then stopped for a bit during the recession and then was built out by MACE developments with RealStar funding and RealStar are a Canadian uh, build to rent company um, and also um, Axis Architects uh, delivered the architecture. Now the, um, the project really started as a kind of research based uh, piece of work um, and the client said to us that the brief is really three main three main points to the brief. One is we need to make this building lean, we need to make it flexible, and we need to try and maximize the opportunities for, for prefabrication. It's in Elephant and Castle, which as you know is a, a key zone of regeneration within London. Um, these are just some initial kind of thoughts with respect to the massing of the building. It consists of a 45 meter tower which is concrete, which I'm going to talk about to you now. Um, but there is also an eight-story podium building to the north, which is full cross-laminated timber construction, um, which is the subject of another presentation. So as the architect started to look at the massing of the tower, they took effectively a square shape, cut the four corners off, and put four balconies, which effectively became eight balconies in terms of how the units were split. And that gave us um, an octagonal floor plate to start to deal with. Now, in terms of stability, we wanted to try and take the onus off the core, trying to use some of the systems that we tend to use on skyscrapers in Asia and North America, where we have these large outrigger floors which mobilize the perimeter frame. Dead often, you lose a whole floor when you do that, and you have these large kind of steel bracing elements. What we looked at doing was to use every single concrete flat slab floor as an outrigger. Okay, so we are taking all the forces from the core through all of those flat slabs and mobilizing the perimeter columns. That means that every element is working as part of the lateral stability system as well as part of the vertical support system. So this is how the floor slab started to evolve. So we've got the core in the middle, which can now be very lean. The walls can be as thin as we possibly can because we have a, an additional stability system helping that core. We then need to push the vertical, uh, the, 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 the vertical structure to the perimeter because this is where we have our vertical outrigger system. So our main vertical structure, which is providing the stability function, is made up of eight blade walls, which go around the perimeter of the floor slabs, uh, and are also a very key part in defining the architecture of the elevations. And finally, what locks that together are these four green internal walls. Again, blade walls, and these are all the same thickness, repeated and standardized all the way up the tower. 
Okay, and that means that effectively all of those elements are working together as part of the stability system. So the connections between these walls and the flat slab is very important. On plan, this is what it looks like. So you can see that in terms of structure internally, we've really only got these four green walls and they are, um, they are uh, uh, orientated on these 45 degree axes, which really means that they lie on partition lines between units. And that gives real freedom in terms of the unit mix from you know one bed, two bed, three bed, four bed, etc. But moreover, this typology survived the recession. It survived a change of client, it survived a change of architect, and it survived a change in tenure and market. We went from market sale to PRS, we built to rent, all of the affordable aspects also changed. But the flexibility of these floor plates, which were driven by this structural and prefabricated solution, were flexible enough to accommodate this change. In terms of the foundations, um, as Jenny said, very common in towers of this kind of um, height, we have a pile assisted raft. So we have a 1.9 meter deep um, raft, which you can see going in here. And that is supported um, or uh, uh, supported uh, partially on um, CFA piles. Now, what we did here, we did a lot of site testing here. We did on-site pressure meter testing, um, which meant that we can actually go with quite slender piles. So these are only 750 diameter, and they're only 15 meters long. And they end in what's called the Harwich Formation, which is a very stiff layer of London clay. Right? So only 15 meter long piles, and they're all CFA as well. They're not bored. Um, that, that Harwich Formation means we have a very, very um, robust bedding, um, giving us actually quite low um, long-term settlements. So this is the frame going up. So you can see the, uh, the eight walls um, around, the, uh, around the perimeter. The column was jump formed. Um, as, uh, as, as Don was saying, and there it is almost reaching the top. Now, because all of these walls are the same all the way up, li we literally only change the reinforcement. So the outer ones are 275 thick by three meters, okay, all the way up, all the same, and then the middle ones are um, 300 mil thick, um, again, three meters, and they're the same all the way up. All we did was to reduce the reinforcement as we went up. Um, and Mace, when they built this, um, used to liken the structure to a cucumber and just say that, you know, wherever you cut it, it's the same. And that meant that the follow-on trades absolutely just went so fast because once they'd understood their cycle times, they just went because every single floor is the same, apart from the top floor where you've got a sky lounge, but basically 44 floors are the same. We have solid precast on the edges and we have twin wall where you pour the in situ concrete in the middle um, for the internals. And that's purely because of the difference in connectivity that you need between wall and slab. In terms of analysis, what's interesting here is that really the thickness of all of these structural components didn't really change because we've used this unique system of using all the structural components as part of the stability. But it did mean that we analyzed the tower completely differently, okay? And that's the key thing here. So from a sustainability point of view, we are using the same amount of concrete, but we're working it much, much harder. The axial shortening that Don was talking about is also interesting here because quite often, the problem with axial shortening is a differential between the core and columns, which means that the columns are, are more stressed than the core, which means that your every floor slab starts to rotate and you get a problem in terms of tolerance on your slab. Because we've got walls and not columns, it means that the stress is a bit more universally distributed across all vertical elements, which means that all the vertical elements effectively shorten by the same amount. So you don't get this problem of an inclined uh, floor system, which, obviously, which, which usually you have to deal with um, with, with, with pre-setting pre and, and, and dealing with the jack as you go up. We also had some interesting corner balconies. Um, the geometry of this floor plate means that these cantilever about four meters. That means that they'd be quite lively at the tip. So they're all tethered together by um, cables. 
which means that if one balcony was excited, um, the, 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 the effectively the, uh, the dynamics of that balcony, the acceleration would be dampened by the mass of all the other balconies that it is connected to. And these cables are then tethered to this crown system at the roof, which kind of completes the sort of the structural story, but it was also very, very important architecturally and also in terms of getting this through planning, um, which pre-recession, there weren't many towers that had got planning in Southwark. So this was one of the first towers that went through. The balconies are all prefabricated, um, as you'd expect. There they go on. Um, and that's the crown on the roof. Um, the final thing I wanted to say is about dynamics. Again, um, the design of a tower and the design of the stability of a tower is always driven by acceleration at the top. And, and as Jenny rightly said, it's about motion sickness. Because obviously those are where you know, your tenants are going to pay the most, either if they buy the apartment or they rent it. And if they feel seasick, that's not good for the developer. Um, in London, high-rise living is fairly new. Um, so engineers that design high-rise living in London over the last sort of decade tend to be quite conservative with our towers, much more conservative than, say, Chicago or New York, where tenants, you know, understand a little bit more about the sway of a building. So because this is quite conservative, we think, and the results of the wind tunnel modelling will also be quite conservative, we have installed equipment at the top of this tower to measure the real-time accelerations. So we, uh, we're testing the wind speed and direction, and also the actual acceleration. These are installed at the moment at the top of High Point. They've been there for about four months. They're going to be there for a whole year, and we will collect the data. We will understand, obviously, how conservative some of these numbers are, and then the key thing is to then learn from it. This project started as a research-based project. We want to end it as one and actually try and feed back some of, that, um, some of that learning. I don't think the engineering, the structural engineering profession is particularly good at actually testing our structures and learning from them. So that's really what we're trying to do here. That's it. Thank you very much.